that was one of the more impressive or enjoyable parts of, of, of Stockholm was seeing all of these streets, but unfortunately they were just summer activations and were going away in, uh, in September. Yeah, but well, it did spur a, a lovely uh, sort of connection. I said that, you know, Lars was really good at connecting with the kids and he asked the kids quite honestly, what do you think about, you know, what we've got going on? And Etienne had just said earlier uh, that he's like, why is there a highway going through the city? And so he said to Lars, you should get rid of the highway. <laughs> and Lars is like, it's Thank you. It's on my mind. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Active Town Channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that is Melissa and Chris Bruntlett from Delft in the Netherlands. Uh, we are actually going to be chatting about their family vacation and going through a whole bunch of cool photos of their explorations. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I certainly did. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but it's a long one. So let's get right to it with Melissa and Chris. Melissa and Chris, thank you so much for joining me once again on the Active Towns channel. Uh, it's always great to join you, John. <laughs> I think it's our third or fourth appearance, but... Oh, who's counting? Yeah, yeah. Who, who's <laughs> counting? Who's counting? Uh, yeah, you know what? I think you're right. This would be your third appearance on the actual podcast, uh, but this is the first appearance, I think, on visual, on the video cam, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last time we chatted, it was all audio. I yeah. remember because... My mic was rubbing on my sweater while I was trying to talk. <laughs> yeah. And thank you very much for doing this. Uh, really, what we are going to do today is just give you an opportunity to pull up your photo album and share some memories of some wonderful uh, personal travel that you all had. And uh, I was just soaking it up on social media uh, because you do a great job um, of posting about your family trips and the things that you see out there. And so uh, for the audience, uh, for the listening only audience, it may be a little rough because we're gonna have lots of photos here. We'll do our best to try to describe what we are seeing on screen. Uh, and then for obviously the YouTube audience, the visual audience, uh, you're going to be treated to a wonderful family vacation that uh, has lots of cool urbanist things that kind of come out. Um, a little bit of active mobility and some of that. Uh, but before we get started, uh, why don't I just turn the floor over to the two of you for a quick uh, introduction. Who are you? <laughs> who are we? Yeah. Um, well, for those that don't know who I am, my name is Melissa Bruntlett. I have been working in advocacy for cycling and urbanism since a long time ago, over 10 years. Um, and work now with an organization called uh, Mobicon, based in the Netherlands, working as a strategic advisor and focusing on communications and engagement around inclusion and equity. So uh, this will be a bit of a departure from my day-to-day -day talk, which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> that was very quick, very efficient. Uh, oh, nicely done. <laughs> um, yeah, and I am, uh, well, Melissa is my better half. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Chris Brunlett, and uh, I'm lucky enough to be the marketing and communication manager for the Dutch Cycling Embassy for the last five years. Yeah, prior to that, Melissa and I uh, worked on a little consultancy called Modacity based in Vancouver, Canada. We've co-authored two books, Building the Cycling City and uh, Curbing Traffic. And uh, yeah, we have, through that advocacy work, landed some pretty incredible roles living and working in the Netherlands. And, and documenting that on social media and building up quite an interest and quite an audience and uh, sharing our insights, our um, experiences, our observations uh, from our day-to-day -day lives and our day-to-day -day travels. Yeah, I think what's interesting where, with where Modacity is now is it started as a passion project, became a job for both of us for a time, and then now is still partly a job, but a lot of a passion project again for us. Yeah. You know, it's kind yes. of back and, yeah. it's made, it's had its mm -hmm. evolution. You know, it, 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 yeah. I, I like to uh, a I, I really cherish our friendship and uh, the ability to uh, to connect and, and chat like this. Uh, and I just I've loved this journey that you have been on. And it really dates back to uh, 2015 um, when you took your trip, I believe it was. Was that actually in 2015 when you guys took your trip? 
the next year, but that's okay. Okay, the beginning the beginning of 2016. <laughs> I, I think I remember 2015 because I know that 2016 is when we actually met at the Pro Walk, Pro Bike, uh, Pro Place conference there in Vancouver because I, I can't, I, I don't recall if you had mentioned that. Yeah, you, you're Canadians. You were in, in Vancouver for a while uh, and, and then you made the move over to the Netherlands because of these opportunities that emerged. But uh, I think it was in 2015, maybe you were doing your, your fundraising and you're doing your prep work uh, to be able to make it over to the Netherlands for that trip. How many weeks was that on that trip? Five weeks, five yeah, cities. So, yeah, 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 five weeks, five cities. Uh, and it really became that platform for uh, the book that eventually emerged, you know, that first book, The Building the Cycling City, of which we did talk about in our first uh, uh, podcast episode. And then the second podcast episode, we talked about the second book, uh, Curbing Traffic. But I've really it cherished our relationship. I you know, had the opportunity, like I said, to meet you um, at the, the conference uh, in person. And uh, and that was a huge delight. And that was that was post uh, trip because that would have been mm-hmm. in, in the fall. And, and then and you guys had already had that opportunity to go. And then it was you caught the tiger by the tail. It was a whirlwind tour of promoting the book. And, you know, next thing you know, you're moving the family over there. And uh, I will uh, refer people to our other episodes. I'll put the links uh, down below uh, to those episodes so that you can dive into the that story, that backstory. But uh, I also uh, cherish the fact that uh, you know, I was in Delft in, uh, gosh, what was it? It was last November, uh, the latter end of October and into November. And and I'm like walking down this little street right here on screen and run into the <laughs> two of you because I was basically staying about uh, two and a half blocks away. But we had not yet connected yet in person uh, there in Delft. And, and so I, I guess that's one of the cool things about living in a people oriented city is you have that opportunity for those chance beatings. And that's why what we're going to be talking about today and these images, I think, is so incredibly important when you build cities for people, you can have those sort of interactions just by chance. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think Chris and I often joke that, well, it's inevitable when people are visiting Delft that we know that we're like, when are we going to bump into this person while we're walking around? Because it's not a huge city. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when, when you were visiting last year, it's like, of course, we're going to bump into John on several yeah. occasions while yeah, he's yeah. around. Um, but it's, it's nice. And it's what we were looking for, for sure. And yeah. here. Well, it was also kind of funny too, is that it, as chance would have it, I was staying in a, an apartment suite right on a, a street that was being re done rebuilt and so it was it was becoming a an improved feet strut and uh that ended up being like uh, the main drag where a lot of people would ride on to get to the grocery store which is right down at the end of the block (laughs) so that was Mm -hmm. kind of a fun thing so i ended up uh, producing a video promoting that and you all ended up producing a video uh promoting you know that transformation as well yeah yeah i think i mean we we always say there's this culture of continual improvement in the planning profession here that other cities could learn a lot from because every infrastructure upgrade, whether it's sewage pipes or gas pipes or, you know, other necessary uh, upgrades that need doing, there's always, it's always seen as an opportunity to make the street better, to make the lives of the residents better. And that street was a great example of uh, uh, now it's, uh, yeah, uh, a, a great feed strat with uh and we use it all the time you know it's lined with uh sunflowers in the summertime they're just an absolute delight to uh cycle by so it's it's good to live in a city that's that's constantly getting better and and thinking about its residents uh and uh there's so many opportunities here uh that we just walk by and we take some photos and share them on social media and next thing you know you know there's people around the world saying yeah yeah, Delft is special, but the Netherlands is quite special because um, there there's still room for improvement, uh, even after all they've accomplished in terms of creating livable human scale, people first cities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So 
here we are. We're we're not here to talk about that stuff. We're actually here to talk yeah. about your vacation. <laughs> uh, and so here's a little family shot. Uh, if I were to guess, I'd say this might be in Copenhagen, but who knows? Where, where's this shot from? You're absolutely right. This is Copenhagen, and this is day one, I think. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll, day we'll, one of yes. Uh, set us yeah, up. We'll, Twelve we'll, days or so. Yeah, 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 12 days. So set us up. Well, w- talk a little bit about the itinerary, uh, why we're doing this, what's the context, because now we're just shifting into family photo mode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is odd for us. Is it okay if I if I run, this was my life for four months before we left? <laughs> yeah, no, of course. Yeah, credit where credit's due. Yeah, so um, I think the year, well, last year we knew we had to go home. Uh, and back to Canada to visit family. It had been, well, the kids and Chris hadn't been back to Canada since we moved. And so it was time to go home and have visits with family. So we knew last year we couldn't do a big family European holiday. We've been doing little ones, obviously, for those who have been following along. But this year was the first time we could do one big one. Uh, Also, the redhead in that photo started college in September. And so we know that our family vacation time is getting smaller and smaller. And so for this summer that just passed, we wanted to do something where we could check off a few of the urbanist things that Chris and I want to do, but also combine it with stuff the kids would be interested in. So from the city perspective, finding the cool things that the teenagers are actually interested in and then uh, having that connection with, nat- with nature. Uh, at the same time, Chris and I were a bit ashamed up until that point that as urbanists working in cycling advocacy, we hadn't been to Copenhagen yet. Okay. And so that was on the list. Uh, so it basically that combined with the desire to be in nature made Norway a very excellent place to take everyone. And so it started with Copenhagen. We're so close to Sweden. Okay, now we got to go to Sweden. Uh, and then from there, uh, heading over to Norway. So it was, yeah, 12 days flying to Copenhagen and then taking the train from Copenhagen to Stockholm, to Oslo, to Trondheim, back to Oslo, because that's how trains work there. Oh, and then over to Bergen. The stop in Billund, of course. Yeah, to yeah. The, <laughs> the Lego house. So yeah. Lego yeah. house, yeah. Yeah. I, I, this was like yeah. a this was a major task. Like you said, you, you, it occupied the better part of four months as you're trying to yeah. plan this out and figure this out. Uh, because yeah, it, it, I mean, it's one thing if it's a business trip, and it says one thing that if you guys are like saying, okay, we're gonna go here, we're you know this city, pick a city, you know Copenhagen, you know or Oslo or whatever, and we're gonna focus in on urbanism things and da da, and meet a whole bunch of people and blah blah blah. If you treat it like a work trip, it's totally different mm-hmm. if you're like doing this multi-dimensional <laughs> Tetris type of yeah. thing where you're okay, family and green time and nature and a little bit of this. Yeah, bit, yeah that's cool. <laughs> and I mean, it was one thing to choose the cities themselves mm-hmm. uh, and the dates, but then the final thing we did was choose what we wanted to do in each individual city. So Melissa created this whole matrix, like a Miro board. It of, was Miro. <laughs> yeah, okay. Of, of, of options, and each of the four members of our family got to pick, pick one specific thing that they would like to do from this big list. And of course, Dad picked the stupid bike ride, quite literally the stupid bike ride, because <laughs> <it>, the kids, <laughs> that was the last thing that the kids wanted to do. Yeah. But then they were able to pick things like the, the museums and, and the other kind of more fun things. Yeah. So that every, all four of us at least got one thing that we were uh, able to choose in each city. Yeah. 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 And even the, the planning from it, that for, for all of our fellow urbanists slash train nerds uh, watching the planning of where we were going to go were involved. Uh, last Christmas, I was given um, Ticket to Ride Scandin- or Nordic version. And I used that with sticky with post-it notes to like pin where I, we were going and which the trains were and writing down, okay, this is the time, this is the cost. So what, even though Chris and I would be playing the game, I would be looking, I'm like, oh yeah, we're going to go from Copenhagen to here. Can we go to Gothenburg? No, I don't think we can go there. And then, so building in a little bit of play and yeah, definitely checking off quite a few transport nerd options as we were going along. Yeah. Well, how much is it, you know, like, for instance, you mentioned, you know, the eye rolling of, you know, the bike ride type of thing. But at the same time, uh, that means a different thing to, you know, people in the Netherlands and people in Copenhagen, uh, because it's just, it's just transport. It's just functional, practical transport. So it's not a bike ride per se. It's like, 
No, it's the most logical, practical way for us to get from point A to point B. Yeah, but I think what, the one thing that we're lucky enough to have is friendly faces in every city we go to, keen uh, people, local advocates, civil servants. In the case of Copenhagen, uh, it was uh, somebody from the municipality who was very excited to show off his city and, and give us a very curated experience of not just the infrastructure, but the various neighborhoods and, and the developments, that, the new housing developments that they were working on, just to get a flavor of, of Copenhagen, stop in the food truck area so we could all get a uh, bite to eat. And, that, and as you know, the, the bicycle just happens to be the easiest way to cover yeah. that much ground uh, over a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. Rumbling teenagers be damned. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And well, the interesting thing about that tour is, yeah, the kids weren't super enthused about going on this bike ride. But um, one thing that we were shown by our, our guide was all these different like new buildings are going up and saying, oh, that's actually a student house. And it's this beautiful tower right. that you would never see as a student house in, in Toronto where we went to school. Uh, and, you know, saying, oh, that might actually be cool if I did a transfer here for a year that if I could live there or in this other, you know, sort of containerized style housing as a student, that would be a neat experience. And so there was just like little things to learn along the way, which we really appreciated on that bike ride anyway, <laughs> just to keep them a little bit more excited. And getting us outside of our urbanism bubble, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I, I actually uh, have a photo of this particular bridge uh, ju just off to, um, you know, my, my left over here. You can't see it in, in screen, but uh, uh, I love this particular facility at night. It, I don't know if you had a chance to experience it at night, um, but it's it's delightful to either ride your bike through or stroll through. Um, just one of the I, I think one of the strengths that Copenhagen does have are, you know, some of these bridge and over water features in terms of uh, walking and biking and how they've been able to activate some of their waterfront. Yeah, I think that was one thing that we were both, I mean, it was both really nice to see, but I think you were really particularly excited about taking some photos of all the different bike bridges. Um, yeah. They Obviously, we have lots of bike bridges here with lots of canals, but right. they're older and, you know, they have their own charm because of how old they are, but to have these sort of real modern takes. Uh, we really felt that when we were in Copenhagen, I think that it was reminiscent of, like, we could see why people from Vancouver really love Copenhagen. Right. Um, there's a lot of similarities between the two. Not the mountain side of things, but the urbanism, for sure. And they're both harbor cities, yeah. Yeah. But in, and, uh, yeah, and I think they could look at the uh, these, these bridges, they're very elegant uh, structures that have been created for non-car infrastructure, uh, and look at them with, with jealousy because so many parts of the world are so far away from justifying these types of investment. Yeah. And if, if memory serves, you had like an entire chapter about building signature sort of facilities and high profile facilities uh, and the value that, you know, cities and municipalities can leverage when you build something that's beautiful. You know, it, it helps bring attention to the fact that it doesn't have to all be ugly and drab and purely functional. Yeah, and I think the nice thing that at least we learned like in the in that chapter from building the cycling city is with the Hoven Ring, it's this beautiful signature thing that people that work in cycling want to go and see, but it was actually quite affordable. And so when you're not building for cars, when you're building for walking and cycling, the budget can go down a bit and maybe you have more room for creativity, which is really nice. It still blows my mind that, that yeah, the Hoven Ring cost 5.8 million euros, which is, you know, a rounding error on a on a highway interchange well it's probably a rounding the, error a, a rounding error on the facility that's underneath the hoven ring yeah, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah when you think of yeah the the city branding the the tourism the uh attention that eindhoven's been able to attract as a result of that one piece of infrastructure yeah uh i mean it's something that that copenhagen i think has accomplished through this cycle snake which is on the screen now is yeah uh, a statement of intent. It's not a lot of money, but it's thoughtfully and, and well designed, and it's very shareable on social media. And, and uh, yeah, it, it just puts this uh, really positive and inclusive uh, image of your city out there to the world, uh, rather than uh, well, nobody's sharing photos of car infrastructure unless it's to dunk on it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What's interesting about the cycle snake too, and this is a great photo that exemplifies it, is that. 
interaction and articulation that it has with the the buildings around it. It's kind of cool. You're up elevated in and you're like, oh, yeah, I, there's all this elevation uh, and all these you know cool stuff that you can then, you know, kind of circle down around and get to. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting is I think it's yeah, when you get over to the other side of this bridge, uh, because of some of the construction projects that are happening, it's this massive, basically bike only space with the exception of you know, pedestrians are obviously, obviously in that space, too. But yeah, you get down there and you're like, whoa, this is like I have, you know, even coming from here, we had so much space when we got to the other side, which was a bit alarming. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I think that's temporary due, yeah, due to the yeah. construction, but still quite impressive to see. And then further up, you saw that's the intersection where they've taken the diagonal. Uh, rather than having to do a two phase less left turn, they've carried the blue paint diagonally through the intersection. Uh, just due to the vast number of cyclists that we're taking a left turn on this intersection. So it's all a, a very linear route that's uh, quite an important spine to their cycling network that gets you up from that intersection right down, I think, 15 or 20 meters down to harbor level. That's quite a vertical uh, gap to bridge through the yeah, the design of this infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And uh, I jumped from that cycle snake uh, photo, which uh, featured a cargo bike, over to a series of photos with a bunch of cargo bikes. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's special uh, about the Copenhagen, the Denmark sort of orientation to cargo bikes. I I find it very delightful. I've I've visited Copenhagen multiple times, and I end up doing the same thing, taking a lot of uh, photos of uh, some of the cargo bike uh, activity. Uh, walk us through what we're looking at here. Yeah, well, I don't know exactly the context of the photo. It looks like somebody's <laughs> celebrating a birthday. I mean, it, I think it was a Saturday afternoon, if I remember. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, this is a fairly common sight. These most of these photos were probably taken in a single afternoon, and the the, the number of cargo bikes, the, the rate of cargo bike ownership in Copenhagen, I think, is higher than any other city in the world, including uh, most Dutch cities, and, and they really have become normalized and and accepted as a uh, a, a part of the mobility mix there. Uh, you see children, young and, and older adults all riding in the front bucket, uh, getting wherever they, they need to go. It really has become uh, the great car replacement uh, tool for a lot of families. It's yeah, a great, it's a great I mean, location for, for stickers too. I should send them a streets are for people yeah. sticker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and I think what's, what's interesting, and we see this a little bit in the bigger cities in the Netherlands too, is that you, a lot of people you see, as, as you said, or, you know, it's this al al alternative option. Um, I wouldn't say alternative. That's not always a better word, but it's just a different option to, to getting around in a minivan. You see so, so many families using it. And in big cities, this often becomes a really comfortable way for families to move around where they might not be as comfortable with younger children riding on their own bikes, but then you have this great tool. So it's not, it's not like ride a bike by yourself or ride in a car. It's ride a bike or we can get a cargo bike where maybe I feel a bit more comfortable moving with my kids, but I still, I'm still your, on a bike or your, or your dogs. dogs. <laughs> yeah. Your entire family. I mean, right here. Boom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and I, go ahead, Chris. I, I, I was just going to say uh, real quickly um, is that what we've noticed is that sort of the design is, is a little different. I mean, they, they really have leaned into the, uh, the trike, uh, configuration where you've got the two wheels mm -hmm. in the front. Uh, and so, uh, rather than a, you know, a, a cargo bike, we're really looking at a cargo tricycle. Uh, so it is a little mm -hmm. bit different on that you know, sense. Yeah, no, they've, they've embraced the, the, the more boxier kind of traditional Christiana cargo bike. Whereas here in the Netherlands, the cargo bikes are certainly getting more sleek, more sophisticated, more with the, the styrofoam uh, buckets and the electric assist, the urban arrows, and, uh, and, and it's so long. Well. It's the longer wheelbase too. Yeah. It's a it's a much longer yeah. Uh, yeah. vehicle to be able to accomplish that and still be stable. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I think yeah. The the one point we always try to make around cargo bikes is. In some ways, in a cycling city, they are a sign of that maybe parents aren't 100% comfortable putting their 8 or 10 or 12-year-old on their own two wheels. Mm -hmm. And so they may be a sign that there's some discomfort and dissatisfaction with the quality of the infrastructure there, that it's a bit too chaotic or unsafe. 
and and that the end game should be every eight year old can get on their own bike and not have to ride in the front bucket of a cargo bike. But in you certainly see it in Amsterdam and in some of the busier Dutch cities that cargo bikes are more prevalent there because the parents just don't quite feel comfortable comfortable enough allowing their child to ride on their own two wheels. Yeah, whether that's like from the other bike traffic or even the existence of car traffic on the streets. And so the challenge, I guess, for a lot of cities is to think about where is that, you know, this is obviously quite positive. It's not, they're not getting around in a minivan or SUV, but how do we get it so that kids also feel comfortable cycling to school and to their local activities? And what, what is the stress and how can we, how can we uh, support to address that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, and I hadn't thought about it in quite that same context before, but that, that really makes a heck of a lot of sense. You know, it, obviously there's a certain amount of advantage to, to being able to, uh, to do this. <laughs> you know, okay. Hey, let's, let's all go into the park and, and et cetera. Oh, how are we going to get the dogs there? Well, okay, well, let's do it this way. Cause they're not going to get on their little doggy bikes and, and pedal their own way. No. <laughs> but, <laughs> so let's, let's pop over to a, a little, just briefly on a little bit of the differences. You just kind of tapped into that, uh, Chris, uh, there. So, uh, you know, continue that theme and we'll just uh, slide through this set of photos. To go to, it was good for us to be able to go to Copenhagen and see what everyone else gets really excited about. And we, like we said earlier, um, we can see why people from Vancouver and the Pacific Northwest or really anywhere in North America or other very car dominated cities go to Copenhagen and they see what is, what the potential is. Um, I think, you know, comparing and contrasting to what we have now in terms of where we live now, you know, things like, like you're showing the bikes on trains, you know, we, we experienced it and it was great. But we obviously also experience the limitations of that. And, you know, we know there's a lot of complaints about in the Netherlands how you can't bring bikes on trains. But we also see where we experience full trains all the time and now can't, you know, this was fantastic to go a little bit further and not have to cycle all the way to the south. I think this was. But we still had to haul our bikes down through an elevator. Yeah. Load them onto the train. Yeah. And, and obviously there's only so much. Capacity. Scalability, yeah. capacity to a system like this where, you know, it, our Dutch privilege is showing, but, you know, when, <laughs> when you're talking about 600,000 bike train journeys a day, it just doesn't work with uh, even a fraction of those. Yeah. It's really, it's really hard for uh, for many people in, in other locations to understand the the context of that is that when you are running full transit, when you are running full trains, it's not easy just to be able to allow your your, your transportation mode uh, before and after your said train trip on board unless you do what I do and you have a Brompton and you can fold that sucker yeah. down into the size of a suitcase yeah. or a, a large briefcase and, mm-hmm. and and tuck it behind one of the seats or underneath one of these seats right here. And so that's one of the things yeah. that I've noticed is that as I'm traveling internationally and I drag my, my little Brompton with me around the world, is that I'm able to have that level of flexibility and also uh, be able to ride to the train station, be able to ride from the train station, but at the same time not uh, take up, quote unquote, too much space and become you know, a, a burden to my other compatriots who are riding the train. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's a whole other trip, maybe a whole other show, but it was, that's just reminds me when we were having the, com- we were meeting a group of people in Barcelona at the beginning of this month. And the joke from the advocacy group is how many people arrived on a Brompton for exactly the reason you're talking about. And I think, yeah, there was something like 10 Bromptons in the room at the time. Yeah. Um, the, Spa- yeah. the, the, uh, the Spanish yeah. have really leaned into that. I was literally uh, interviewing mm-hmm. um, uh, Manu Calvo yesterday and uh, looking at some of the footage from Seville. And yeah, it was like Brompton, Brompton, Brompton. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Okay, continue. Um, yes. I, I mean, I think we have to be careful because, uh, you know, we, again, Copenhagen has accomplished a lot, but I think even when you talk to the people that live and work in Copenhagen, they'll be the first to admit that there's still a whole other level for them to achieve that is, uh, in a lot of ways, looks on the, the Dutch cities and the Dutch model with jealousy and, and, and aspiration because a lot of what they've accomplished has been basically to put a cycle path down on every single street with very little consideration for reducing the amount of lanes of cars or, or the amount of car traffic 
So it still feels like a very car dominated city with bike lanes on every street, which is, of course, amazing from a North American view, but shouldn't be the end game for urbanists and, and for Copenhageners themselves, that they should be really having these difficult conversations about traffic, calming traffic circulation, improving the design of their intersections, which, you know, we had conversations with one of the mayors of Copenhagen who came uh, to the Dutch Cycling Embassy specifically to ask us about intersection design. You know, there's still a lot of areas where the Copenhagen model uh, has room for improvement. The, the lack of bike parking at train stations, the yeah, other really uh, areas where the, the system itself, yeah, doesn't live up to expectations or or uh, its potential. And and of course, there are huge numbers of people cycling there. But we would argue it's almost in in spite of the infrastructure there, and it works uh, safely because of the the sheer numbers. There's safety in numbers rather than really high quality, comfortable cycling infrastructure and effective traffic calming. But I think our kids would say when we ask them at the end of the end of the cycle tour, how did it feel to cycle there? They're like, yeah, no, it was comfortable. The intersections aside, um, because we're very much used to not quite the same treatments in intersections, but, you know, for our two teenagers, they found it quite enjoyable. So it's, yeah, as Chris said, from a North American perspective, if Copenhagen was the very first city, we had, cycling city we had traveled to, I think it would have had the same enamoring for us as, as everyone else that we know. And we, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't still go and learn from it because there's a lot to learn from Copenhagen and a lot that can be applied um, around the world for sure. Again, our, our Dutch privilege. Uh, yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I actually um, put Copenhagen in sort of the same bucket that I put uh, Rotterdam for, for slightly different reasons. But I, I like to point to those as, as two cities that are good examples for uh, North American cities that are trying to move away from car centricity um, or, you know, cities around the globe that are doing the same thing. They they Maybe they have wide boulevards and streets and it's been car centric design and they're looking for, well, how do we achieve that next? incremental step, which is very nicely illustrated in this photo here of, okay, well, what can we do to put in a generous uh, cycle path in that is parking protected? There's still lanes for cars uh, and, and, and be able to make that next incremental step. Not quite Delft level of traffic calming and, and, and sort of, you know, people centric design, but it is a nice incremental step uh, to weaning ourselves off of drive everywhere for everything at super high speeds. Exactly. Yeah. Very, very fascinating. And of course, we've got the Danish blue in the uh, the intersection areas here. And yes, I, I would concur. That's that's one of the biggest challenges is uh, we, we don't see as many of the protected uh, infrastructure, you know, at the intersections. It's sort of like, OK, we're going to slap some paint down here to indicate that this is a conflict zone. Um, it's very analogous to what a, a lot of North American uh, cities are doing with just, you know, giving up at the intersection and painting some green uh, across that conflict zone. And I think for a place like Copenhagen, it works because of that sheer volume of people on bikes. And so, the, you know, cars know blue means there's going to be lots of people coming through here and they adjust their behavior in the same way that on certain streets where maybe we don't have, uh, it's not a cycle street here or it's not all right, it's all paved red or there's not bike lanes. People in driving will behave accordingly because they know they're going to see bikes but it comes with a sheer number. But how do we how do we make sure people are safe before we get to that uh, volume? Yeah, the my the, my last trip to, to Copenhagen was a, when t in 2019. Um, uh, Laura and I just you know sort of jumped on the plane, went over there. We had our Bromptons with us uh, because it was uh, as part of a, a Dutch trip that we were on anyways, and uh, we did. The, the stuff that we enjoy doing, which is riding from the airport, uh, riding to the airport. So we rode our bikes to Schiphol and then uh, rode our bikes uh, from uh, the Copenhagen airport into the, the little Airbnb apartment that we had uh, there in the, in the, I can't remember the name of that uh, uh, neighborhood we were in there in Copenhagen, but it was really nice to just sort of settle in for a couple of days of being able to zip around and, and do all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then we connected with you all later in during that trip. So that was fun. 
for those that may be curious, the activities for the kids in Copenhagen were, I recognize it's not in Copenhagen, but was the Lego house. Oh, for yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And That's then for right. Leo, uh, it was Tivoli, Tivoli Gardens. So yeah, we had our amusement park fix as well, uh, including uh, she and I. There's the Lego. The... Here's the Lego. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 How far away uh, is that then... to visit to the Lego uh, city? It's not an easy trip uh, in terms of time from Copenhagen to Billund. It was a train and then a bus. I think it was two hours almost. Yeah, which almost made it a bit too far for a day trip, but we made it work. We made it work. And we were told that it's it, there's not a direct train to Billund right now because it's under construction. Mm. I think there will in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there's, yeah, something to be said for Tivoli about having that amusement park right in the center of the city. Oh, um, yeah. And it was, yeah, full. <laughs> okay. Let's jump over to Stockholm. So, yeah. Sweden. Yeah, mm -hmm. Stockholm was stop number two. Um, yeah, and I think we, I mean, I think we just picked Stockholm because it we wanted to go and it made the most sense for the train journeys. We had also had Gothenburg on our list and had heard okay. from a, looking for a quieter city, it might be a good place to go, but extended our journey too much so that's that's a trip for another time okay now real quick did you did you guys skip over malmo well we stopped in malmo because our train direct from copenhagen got canceled <laughs> <laughs> so we had to uh, jump over to and so we just really experienced the the train station but yeah yeah okay yeah but it the area around the train station was quite pleasant yeah. and i think <laughs> we definitely need to need to go back but in in this instance yeah we had to hop on the High speed train to Stockholm. And the, yeah, the real kind of, uh, the cool thing about Stockholm, again, having friendly faces in every city means that somebody always there that's excited to show off their city to you. And in this case, earlier in the year at, at Bello City in Leipzig, I had uh, connected with Lars uh, Strongren, who was a, a long time cycling advocate. For, he was the I think executive director of the Swedish Cycling Union, but was recently elected deputy mayor of Stockholm for mobility and urbanism and was just fresh in the job six months and, and very excited to show off uh, his city from that perspective. So he invited us first to City Hall to uh, sit in his office for coffee and he took out all these maps and uh, talked about his plans uh, and really engaged with the children in particular to ask them their opinions on on certain parts of the city. Uh, but then we were lucky enough to get on, out on our bikes and, and spend a couple of hours cycling around Stockholm, including experiencing a lot of their summer streets. And what you're seeing on on the screen here is one of, I think, 55 arteries in Stockholm that they opened to people during the summertime as kind of demonstration projects and really activate the spaces and encourage people to sit and dine and play. And yeah, here's another one here a mm -hmm. bit further away. So yeah. I think that was one of the more Im impressive or enjoyable parts of, of, of Stockholm was seeing all of these streets, but unfortunately they were just summer activations and were going away in, uh, in September. Yeah. So it did spur a, a lovely uh, sort of connection Chris said that you know, Lars was really good at connecting with the kids and he asked the kids quite honestly, what do you think about, you know, what we've got going on? And Etienne had just said earlier uh, that he's like, why is there a highway going through the city? And so he said to Lars, you should get rid of the highway. <laughs> and Lars is like, thank you. It's on my mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, that's powerful yeah. though, right? When you hear it from, yeah. a, a, you know, a, a child and, and saying, yeah, why? What? This this is a non sequitur. This does not make sense. Why are you doing this to yourselves? Yeah. No, we. I mean, in that it was just the evening before we were walking through the medieval center of Stockholm, packed with tourists. Beautiful historic area, and all you can hear is the drone of motor vehicles in the background because there's a, an elevated motorway uh, that runs right through the center of the city and. Lars was, uh, yeah, he was keeping his cards close to his chest, <laughs> but he, he kind of spelled out his timeline a little bit. And he's like, first, we need to do this project and this project. And then maybe around 2030, we'll be ready to uh, take the highway down. Wow. Wow. 
And not to plug another book, but uh, you you talk about that. Uh, you talk about noise in your your second book and how damaging and pervasive and insidious automobile noise in particular is when we're exposed to it continuously within a city. So, yeah. 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 And it's, I mean, yes, you know, for as beautiful as the old city is for in, in Stockholm, yes, they do have a lot of cars still going on a lot of the major streets in the rest of the city, but there was still a feeling of, of quiet and calm uh, not necessarily just in the old city center, but along the neighborhood streets. And yeah, there's Lars on yeah. the uh, yeah <laughs> on the maps. He says he gets a real kick out. Of it. Like every meeting involves a map, is what he told us. It's all about drawing and showing. Yeah. But the uh, the image you saw, showed er, uh, one earlier. There's a funny story about that. Is there was a a municipal ban on removing car parking spaces or, or some kind of antiquated reason why certain businesses and uh, couldn't reallocate the, the curb space outside. But in this case, it's the Netherlands uh, embassy. Uh, they use their diplomatic immunity to uh, put out a uh, car parking space <laughs> <laughs> uh, and allow people to park their bicycles there. So I think it was a cool kind of uh, little bit of leadership there from the, the Dutch uh, in trying to uh, show how silly that that rule is and, and that there are ways to work around it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I think a big highlight for us, not necessarily was this the summer streets and this like getting the bike tour, but I think it was accidental. But we discovered that Stockholm has put a big effort into when they put in their metro line to lighten things up and because they have so many dark summer months. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we discovered that their metro stations are all quite create not all of them but many of them are quite creatively decorated and so we ended up it was our last night in Stockholm we ditched the kids yeah they were not interested (laughs) and you and I with our cameras in hand beautiful uh guided tours that you can find on the internet that point out the best of the best stations and so we got a a two hour or four hour metro ticket and uh, uh yeah raced from station to station just to try and soak it all in. Yeah. It's just a really clever way to make it more interesting. And, you know, obviously some of the stations are a lot more spectacular than others, like like one with a rainbow in it. Um, but even like for myself, I don't necessarily like being underground. And actually there was one time during the tour with Lars where we went through a bike tunnel and the, you could see the mountain above me, which I did not enjoy. <laughs> But to go in and see how they've reused the fact that they had to blast through rock to create these uh, and, you know, add some art in a space that a lot of people are using was, um, yeah, I, yeah, I think we really enjoyed it. I think, you know, the one downside is you obviously have to pay to play to be able to actually see it. So you have to be able to, you need to pay for a ticket to get into the station in the first place. Right. But it's a nice, you know, I do appreciate good, good subway art. Uh, I love Montreal's retro 70s never changing stations for it's just because it's nostalgia but you know we like going through in, in Paris and seeing what they have so this was just a nice sort of addition to the lovely subway systems we can experience yeah this is fun I mean it's very it, it's it's neat to have something that's a little whimsical and and different uh that you can you know it, it, again throw th- some light and some paint and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it just creates that sense of fun while you are just going about your daily business of trying to get from point A to point B. (laughs) Very cool. And I think there was this funny moment where we were like crouching down on the ground, trying to get the best camera angle. And it's just like commuters rolling their eyes at us, you know, another, <laughs> another, another photographer, amateur photographer trying to like, uh, put it oh for them. Gosh. Just more, there. more tourists, those, those crazy Dutch, yeah. what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> Notice how I said Dutch, not Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then we decided, ah, what the heck, let's, let's make our way to Oslo, Norway. <laughs> yeah. So I got to see, uh, yeah, it was not a long, not a short train, but yeah, we hopped on the train from, from Stockholm to Oslo. I got to walk around there for half a day after a conference I went to in, uh, well, last year, this time last year. Um, and so I was really excited to bring everyone back. 
a little bit worried because I think we were all getting a little bit tired of urbanism. And then we found, Chris found this. This was his, his thing he wanted <laughs> to do. Was this my thing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and I think all of us, all four of us were quite smitten with Oslo in particular because it's a big city of one plus million people, but it really embraces and, and activates its natural spaces. And this is the perfect example of that. It's the Akerselva River Walk, which is an eight kilometer long urban walk. If you can call it urban, because it starts uh, at one of the lakes on the outskirts of the city in the forests uh, and really kind of goes through, follows the route of this river all the way to Oslo Central Station in the heart of the city, following the old industrial areas, the old factories, brick factories, and uh, iron, wrought iron bridges, and really kind of, yeah, I guess we would refer to it as kind of a forest bath, but uh, really enjoyed w walking the whole eight kilometer route, uh, all four of us, and, you know, stopping it for uh, various points along the way, but uh, it was uh, probably Something one for of delicious the... tacos. You need to remember mention <laughs> that we went for tacos and they were amazing. <laughs> yeah, but it's you know there's a lot of yeah uh, businesses and amenities that have popped up along this walk. And yeah, I think there's not enough opportunities like that within cities to really feel like you're uh, well a calming space or a restorative space. Uh, mm -hmm that you're away from the hustle and bustle of the city. But in this case, we did really feel like we were in the countryside and we were walking right through the spine of, of Oslo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Melissa, I believe that you had the opportunity to, to meet up with uh, Professor uh, Daniel Pietkowski uh, at Oslo Met. Uh, was that uh, at yeah. that conference the previous that, year? Yeah. Okay, at the good. conference. Yeah. 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 So it was, yeah, nice to, nice to have a friendly connection. Um, yeah. He came over and introduced myself, said, we know John. <laughs> so it was, yeah, nice to have that. Yeah. Away from home, home connection, even though home in this case is all of North America. <laughs> yeah. No, it's always nice to have friendly faces around the world. Yeah. That's great. And uh, soon to be a, 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 another Island Press uh, published author as well. So. We're excited oh, to see his book come out. Uh, okay, so now we're in the urban city center of, of Oslo, and uh, it, I, I'm seeing something that's missing here. I mean, if this is going to be a <laughs> vibrant city, why aren't there cars? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, to be fair, they're not too far away. Um, but I think that's one of the – that I noticed the first time I went to Oslo and then we, we experienced again is, you know – you. A lot of people talk about, you know, you get out the station at um, Amsterdam Central and it's so quiet. And we have the same experience when we come back to Delft when we're traveling. As you walk out of the station and it's quiet and people think this is an experience you can only have at a Dutch train station. But when you walk out of Oslo Central, it's pedestrians, it's a few bikes. Like there's, there's not necessarily a lot of bikes moving around, but it's, it's growing. And then there's trams. trams and that's it. And then you walk directly onto a pedest this pedestrianized street. And so that it's the same experience. I walked out after a busy conference. Uh, we walked out after being on a train for eight hours and it's just quiet. Um, there's just, it's just the sound of people. And so it's just this great proof that it's not this like secret that can only be achieved in the Netherlands. It, it exists in other cities and definitely in Oslo. And I think it helped. I and think it was yeah. quite a contrast coming from Stockholm that we're piloting these car free streets to a city that it just, implemented them on a permanent basis. Uh, yeah, it's part of a specific low car livability strategy to yeah, improve the economic vitality, the social fabric of the city. And yeah, there's a lot of really great spaces for people, uh, not just in the center of Oslo, but stretching into uh, the residential areas. This is a completely car-free shopping street in the northeast of the city. It's just trams gliding through there and it's just lined with pedestrians and terraces and and really busy shops and uh, yeah, lots of green space. And we found ourselves going back there uh, quite a few times throughout our, our stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then of course, you know, all of that just helps to complement their, their commitment to vision zero. And then, you know, Oslo is often touted as one of the cities that's been able to actually achieve that goal. Uh, and that isn't through, you know, is not by accident is very much because of a lot of these, these programs that we got to experience. We were there. 
I appreciate too, uh, Melissa, what you said about uh, how in Stockholm they were piloting uh, these in installations and these interventions, whereas uh, Oslo has made a a firm commitment. I was reminded uh, when I was uh, reminiscing about uh, the car-free day that I was able to attend in Paris in uh, September of 2015. And soon after that, Oslo had announced their initiative to, to really boldly move forward with a plan to try to you know, cut their addiction to automobiles, which was still very much relevant in, in the fourth quarter of, of 2015. Um, I know that their ambitious plans that they had announced back then didn't come to fruition, but it seems like uh, there's definitely some major success stories that uh, that we can point to, including you know some of these car-free streets, as well as uh, as you mentioned uh, uh, with Vision Zero and actually being able to achieve uh, you know a, a massive decrease in the number of fatalities uh, you know on the streets uh, of Oslo. It's. I know they're there. It's challenging, and they're not getting to where they originally had envisioned. But what I'm seeing here, and it sounds like what you have experienced, is is really quite impressive. Yeah, and we will see it again in the other cities that we visited as well, and and I've seen it in a couple others that I've had the opportunity to visit uh, in the last year or so, also. But you know, there's this interesting sort of yeah, dichotomy happening in in Norway where. You know, there's there seems to be this commitment to try to move towards more sustainability, more safety, but they still do very much rely on cars. Topography, obviously, being one of the big reasons why, but also the distances. I mean, we come from Canada. We know that cities are far apart and sometimes, you know, there aren't always alternatives. And so they're in this weird, challenging place right now is how do we shift to getting people more access to more options for transport uh, and shifting away from cars in you know, a challenging place where, you know, a lot of their economy does rely on (laughs) car-based economies. So yeah, it'll be interesting in the years to come to see how they start to address that or if they start to address that or, or how they find different solutions to those challenges. And, and you were very coy there uh, mentioning, you know, car based <laughs> economy. I mean, and, and Professor Piotkowski <laughs> and I were having this discussion at uh, at Velo City in Leipzig, Germany, uh, a few months ago. And, you know, I basically just point blank asked him, uh, you know, hey, I mean, you guys are like a major oil producing country. Politically, I mean, how is that really sitting? He says, yeah, it's it's a bit of a challenge. You know, when your economy is so based on this addiction to, you know, propelling this forward. But it's interesting how uh, the culture can kind of divide that and say, well, yeah, yeah there's that. Yeah, we're, 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 we're producing oil and gas. But at the same time, this is important, too. So it is interesting to see how they're navigating and deftly walking that fine line of a commitment towards safer streets, a commitment towards uh, trying to do something about global warming, um, it, as well as, you know, that's part of their economy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen in other places when that that economic driver is taken away, that there's obviously negative knock on effects. But yeah, I don't know. I think I'm I'm always optimistically hopeful that a lot of these places will find new solutions. But maybe that's just my blissful optimism. Well, it, it's so <laughs> incredibly powerful when you experience these cities that become more people oriented. And uh, in the in the previous uh, you know series of photos, we were looking at mostly pedestrian zones. Now we're going to start to look at some of the uh, the Oslo cycle infrastructure and how they are embracing. And and the one thing that uh, Professor Piatkowski uh, Daniel mentioned to me was that I think he did get himself a, a cargo bike, and so he's you know taking the step into that realm because he's got two two kids, and and he's like you know because he doesn't need it to get to work. He can literally walk to work. <laughs> so. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it, that's something that they're working on now. So let's let's you know, take a look at uh, cycling in Norway here. Go on, bike nerd. Bike nerd. <laughs> well, I, I think you know, are we as you undoubtedly see on social media always get the same bad faith arguments in our comment section and in our replies. Uh, yeah, but the Netherlands is flat. Yeah, but the, they don't have winter there. Yeah, but 
uh, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it 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 was quite uh, inspiring to see what is a very hilly, mountainous city mm -hmm. that gets its fair share of snow in the winter time, going all in on its cycling infrastructure, and it's no by no means perfect, but they are uh, where they can applying pretty high level uh, infrastructure. That's a pretty hilly street right there. I mean, that looks like great, great uh, shot. San yeah. could be San Francisco, San Francisco, but uh, providing physical separation where it's necessary, providing low traffic, uh, local streets where they can uh, to complement that and building out this network and the numbers are still quite low. I think it's somewhere between five and 10% of journeys, but they have a roadmap and they have some political commitment and yeah, watch, watch Oslo because I think even, well, Jason Slaughter did a whole old video on, on cycling in Oslo and kind of predicted it would be one of the, the world's next best cycling cities. I, I don't know if I've seen enough to <laughs> agree, uh, but it's, uh, it's certainly one to watch in the, in the years ahead. Yeah. It's, I'm really just soaking up a lot of these images. Yeah. This is an interesting example because it's yeah. like, uh, they didn't want to choose between the bike path and the tree. So they kept them both. Yeah. <laughs> and I see, I, I see this image, uh, imagery, you know, frequently, uh, literally I mentioned that I was, uh, chatting with, uh, uh Manu uh, Calvo from, from Seville and we, paused on a photo just like this uh, in our recording session where they needed to save the tree. And uh, in that case, it was a two-way cycle track and they literally just split the lanes and went right around the tree, <laughs> kept the yeah. tree. You know, it's like, we're not giving up on that tree, especially in a place uh, like Seville where they need the tree canopy for the heat for sure. But uh, what, what was the uh, orientation to motor vehicle speeds, uh, like I say on this street, I saw the previous, uh, uh, photo was 40 kilometers per hour and I'm like, e 40 kilometers. That's kind of an odd one. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to uh, the, the Dutch approach of it's kind of either, you know, 30 or 50 kilometers per hour. And we're trying to phase out those darn 50 kilometer per hour ones, because those are, uh, the, the fatalities and the serious injury rates on those streets are, are not very, uh, much worth crowing about. Um, but yeah, it, it, would this street have been, uh, since it's uh, the, the orientation of it, would this street most likely be a 30 kilometer per hour street? I wasn't paying attention when we were walking along it. Maybe you know better. <laughs> they are, I mean, they are going kind of all in on the 30 kilometer an hour on as many streets as possible. You would occasionally see 40, I think, as an intermediary step or as a political compromise, maybe. Right, right. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, and it's, and, and yeah. it's, I can understand that, okay, well, we do have like a, a little bit of a physical separation here, but I still cringe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really? 40 kilometers per hour? Eey. Yeah. And this was down by the, the harbor, the, the docks, so I think it was a lot of freight trucks and and maybe this was a, a compromise with the uh, the logistic companies along uh, those routes. Mm -hmm. uh, but a nice raised crosswalk there, which again we're we're still all too rare in urban environments. But in, in this case, you know they've. Uh, uh, it yeah, got, it kind of looks like it was. Details, right. Yeah, I mean, it, do you, can you tell? I mean, it to me it looks like it might have been actually a a, a retrofit. Yeah, so this um, this is part of the newer development that's happening along the waterfront. And so, yeah, this would have been like a former, I think it's probably part of what would have been the highway that eventually they've buried underneath the waterways to free up this land to do the development they've done and to quiet out the space. I mean, to be fair, it's probably more about the development than quieting <laughs> uh, in a lot of ways, but it's a nice uh, byproduct. But yeah, I think in that case, they're looking at how do we take the old streets that we have and, and make them work for the purpose of what we're trying to do here. In that case, that area is still under construction, so doing it in a way that can be adapted as needed. Well, this this photo but actually think, may be yeah. a hint towards uh, that other street that we were questioning and, and talking about, because it looks like a similar type of edge lane road uh, treatment here and uh, and the 30 kilometer per hour uh, sign in that area. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah I think overall, yeah, overall, I think Oslo, everyone, it was... <coughs> 
it was everyone's favorite. So then I started worrying that the rest of the trip would be a, a, a tailspin down yeah, yeah. <laughs> from there. <laughs> but I think, you know, we've taken our kids to so many big cities and they've kind of said like enough is enough. And in Oslo, everyone had a good time. Everyone enjoyed themselves. We got to do some cool things. We got to take a tour of the Opera House, which I highly recommend people do. It's very cool. And with uh, Leo now studying for theater production, we got to go backstage as well, which was also uh, oh, very a cool experience. For, yeah, <laughs> not well, a you, personalized tour. It is part of the tour. Absolutely, but, <laughs> absolutely. It was so cool. Well, you mentioned travel, and so we've got a whole bunch of uh, travel photos here as you're making your way around to, to different locations. Uh, is this train travel? <laughs> no. <laughs> so this was like, this was almost our very last thing that we did. So mm-hmm. prior to this, we had we taken the train up to Trondheim. Um, and then this was between uh, the tra- journey from Oslo to Bergen. There's this historic rail line uh, called the Flam Railway. Flam, I think is how they say it. And we, yeah, we decided to stop off halfway, take this train line down, see the, it's, so I didn't mention at the beginning, but part of this rail journey was also inspired by all the beautiful railway journeys of the world shows that came up during the pandemic. And this line was on it. And so it became part of our trip. And we wanted to do something when we got to Flum because you can't just get there and then get back on the train and go back up. Uh, so those images you saw earlier were a floating sauna ah, on the fjord nice, nice. <laughs> where you could jump into the water, <laughs> Yeah, which in, it's not too expensive, but we would highly recommend that anyone and everyone do it. It was it was awesome. <laughs> this is just awful. This is so ugly. I know. It was just, just terrible. So oh, yes. <laughs> You're definitely getting your green fix on this uh, trip. Yeah. 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 And the accommodations. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Well, that was the that was the last train journey of the. Uh, the entire trip was the night train from Bergen to Oslo. And uh, yeah, I'd be lying if I said I got a good night's sleep. It was quite right. uh, shaky and noisy, <laughs> but uh, still, yeah, you get your uh, uh, your accommodation and your transportation rolled into one. And uh, yeah, that was a, uh, a nice way to end the trip mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, we did pay a little bit extra so the kids had their own berth. Which was also nice. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. Good, good, good move there for sure. Yeah. So we we also have uh, some reflections here from Trondheim. Hmm. Yeah. So I think I don't know why we picked Trondheim, other than it's the third biggest city yeah. in, the, in Norway. <laughs> it does have the yeah. bicycle lift, so you know that was on the list of like see the bicycle lift. <laughs> okay. But it was just I think it was a really great small scale city. 400 kilometers from the Arctic Circle. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so quite up there in terms of latitude. Yeah, I, I mean, I think from an urbanist perspective, it may not be the most interesting city in the world. It's still very much a touristy kind of town. It's not doing too much on walking and cycling and public transport, but it was, it was a nice little, uh, yeah, mini break for all of us. But I think one thing that, we, and we talked about this, and this is the tram that we took. We talked about this with the Norwegian Road Authority when they invited us to come and talk about our trip with them. Is It's great that they have this really old tram line that takes you up to the mountain to Lian, which is the name that's on the tram there. And we went hiking. And to have that access, I think it's something that we really appreciated to be able to leave the city and get into nature to go for a hike. And it's something that was always a little bit challenging for us in, in Vancouver. Um, oh, we'd have to rent a car. Yeah. yeah. Or take a lot of buses and, and long, long uh, Skytrain rides. So, to, yeah, to be able to go and yeah, have another forest bath and, you know, be next to water. It wasn't warm enough to swim, unfortunately. It was a bit cold that day. But I think it's something that I would hope the people that live in Trondheim or Bergen has something similar, or even Norway, uh, or sorry, Oslo. Uh, that they appreciate is they have this access to nature right in their city that a lot of people would be quite jealous of. And you can get up to the top of the mountain for whatever, the two euro tram fare. And the we were told the really interesting story behind that tram is it was very nearly ripped out with the rest of Trondheim's tram network after the Second World War. And it was only because of a group of 
enthusiasts, tram enthusiasts, protested to keep the tracks and then put up the money to keep it running for a couple of years uh, through fundraising and, and, and the like. And then eventually the regional authorities decided to take it back over again. But it's a one and only tram that's remaining of that what, what was a quite an extensive network. And it does, I mean, it was quite busy on the, the day we wrote it. Uh, mm-hmm. But with people just getting to the, the residential areas that are uh, snaking up the mountain, but then, of course, yeah, taking their... Uh, their walk or their hike or wherever. Into the- I'd love to amplify before we get to Bergen. I'd love to amplify what you just said there, Melissa, about the fact that it's so incredibly important for cities to think about having access to activity assets and access to nature uh, for people who don't drive, don't have access to a car. Um, it, it, to mm-hmm. me, it's just bogus that, you know, so much of what we have in North America, if you don't have a car, you can't get to the mountains. If you don't have a car, you can't get to that park. And, and then you end up having these ridiculously large parking lots, um, you know, associated with these parks because, you know, you just can't get there from here, you know, from your home, you, you, you have to be able to, uh, you know, to, to drive there. And so having meaningful, safe alternatives, uh, you know, to the automobile is incredibly important, whether that is a tram, uh, I could just imagine trams, you know, getting people to various ski resorts in, in British Columbia or in Colorado, uh, having, uh, access to, you know, wonderful pathways like what we saw along the river there in in Oslo where that pathway is is both access to nature uh, and you know it gets into the city and it's also an easy escape from the city down to nature too so I think it's really really important to to amplify that fact that cities you'd be thinking about these ways that you can feed nature you can feed parks and uh, one of the initiatives that we have here in the United States is the uh, 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 TPL, the Trust for Public Land, has an initiative of every single resident should be 10 minute walk from a park, a trail, an open space. Uh, And and I think that that's kind of like one of those baseline levels of treating your your residents with a certain level of dignity uh, of being able to to access nature and access parks. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. 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 Now I we're think, in Bergen. You know, <laughs> yeah. So I just, I would add yeah. to that, that, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, aging in place and, and cities being able to be places where our seniors can age in place. And part of that includes that access to nature to help with their moods, but also that access for, for kids. Again, the people that maybe don't have access to a car, but should have the same access. Well, yeah. What to say about Bergen? I mean, I think uh, the reason that urbanists go to Bergen these days is to see, uh, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, the 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 Falling Dallins Tunnel, Falling Dallins Tunnel, uh, the brand new, brand new, just opened in the spring of this year, walking and cycling tunnel uh, that cuts three, almost three kilometers, I believe, through mm-hmm. uh, the center of this mountain and. In, in the north of Bergen, uh, and it's really a showstopper of a project. I mean, and even the photos don't quite do, do it justice. Um, something that, well, uh, the, as the, the project managers told us, uh, was kind of an afterthought, uh, a byproduct of uh, an evacuation tunnel that they had to build for the tramway that was also being cut through the mountain. and. Uh, they just decided, hey, let's do something with this space. Let's ac- activate it. And I think there were a lot of fears around social safety and around graffiti and around crime. Oh, there you go. Feeling styles. Feeling styles. <laughs> yeah, I, thought I'd, I thought I'd zoom in on that for you. To help you out with that. <laughs> uh, but through, yeah, really kind of light materials, a beautiful piece of art in the center that's actually a sun uh, a representation of a sundial because it's, the last place that's actually going to get natural sunlight, <laughs> uh, but that shows the time of day, and uh, otherwise it's just kind of colored lights and and, and some plastic sheeting, uh, and uh, but the community has really embraced it in the what is the rainiest city in Europe. It's become an activity asset, as you would say, John, for joggers, for rollers, for cyclists, uh, to even do multiple laps back and forth in this tunnel. 
uh, and also form the spine of this eight kilometer long greenway that's connected to the tramway uh, that will be the site of future development around housing, office space, park space. It's this green spine that the uh, city of Bergen will be uh, expanding and, and growing around. And it's quite, uh, quite interesting to see that level of foresight and planning uh, around something that's not a motorway. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. How cool. Going back to that, that comment I made about being underground, I yeah. really appreciated the plastic sheeting and not seeing the mountain above me. Okay. But the, okay. the use of color in that mountain tunnel <laughs> yeah. was, yeah, it was, it's nice because you have that like colorful aspect, but it also cleverly is, um, set up to indicate how far along you are. So to know how far you are in, but how much is left. Um, so if you're concerned about getting out uh, fast, you know where to go. And that actually serves as part of their evacuation strategy. It's not just for people like me that don't want to spend too much time under a mountain, but more to understand if you travel this way, the exit is close versus, you know, traveling to the middle. So I take it, Melissa, you're not okay. going to be uh, doing any cave diving anytime soon. Yeah, probably not. It's super interesting to me, but probably not. <laughs> and I mean, they, I think the nice thing about this project is despite the fact that the kids think that every bike ride we take is a stupid bike ride, they were actually uh, quite impressed and really quite enjoyed this experience. It was mm-hmm. something they'll, they were talking about long after we got back to the Netherlands. Yeah. And now, yeah, we've got a little time lapse of the experience. <laughs> You know, it's it's really interesting. I mean, you've you've got uh, two young adults uh, there that are are making their way into, you know, adulthood. They're starting to to you know understand what what they really you know like and and, and all this stuff. And they've been like sponges absorbing, uh, uh, you know, all of this. And and I can remember uh, when I when I filmed you as a family unit walking to school. Uh, back in 2016. You remember that? I think so. Yeah. Vaguely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it's, it's been kind of neat, you know, uh, vicariously over, over these uh, you know, six, seven years, uh, watching the kids grow up and, you know, completely moving to a different location. And uh, uh, they're just so delightful, by the way, your, your, your children are, are absolutely a delight to, to, to be around. And we had uh, dinner together uh, in, in November and, and that was super, super cool. And uh, it, it's so wonderful to, to like experience this vacation uh, with you, your family vacation and uh, and all these sights and sounds and, you know, the, the whole thing. It just it warms my heart that you all are, you know, where you are in life and where you are in this journey that you have with your young family and uh, and being able to experience, you know, this, I mean, nothing against, you know, visit coming back and visiting family in North America, but give me a break. I mean, that was freaking <laughs> awesome. And it's freaking awesome yeah. that you uh, were willing to share your vacation uh, with me uh, today. Again, I'm very selfish in the sense that I'm kind of living <laughs> vicariously uh, through you. I had hoped to make it to many of the cities that, that you had the opportunity to visit. I may have to call upon you, uh, Melissa, and some of your uh, yeah. planning and, and say, hey, I, it looks like I am going to get up there and, and in that uh, part of the world uh, to visit. Any any final thoughts and reflections from both of you ab- about this experience and uh, uh, and what's what's up next, you know, for next summer? Are we already planning our trips? Uh, not yet for next year. We, we have a couple of things in the works, but. Yeah, nothing, nothing firm yet, except definitely a trip back to Canada. If, you know, now it'll have been two years again, so we'll have to go go back next summer and see some family. Um, but I think, yeah, for like like I said at the beginning of the of this, you know, we're recognizing that our kids are getting older, and the family trips that we'll be able to do all together is getting, you know, the the excuse to make them come with us is getting smaller and smaller. Um, I think. For me, I think this trip achieved what I wanted it to is it was a chance to, you know, do the urbanist stuff that we really like to do, um, but like, you know, balance it with things the kids really wanted to do. I think we all learned that we all love Norway. And so we will be going back again. (laughs) Um, I think probably because, you know, we missed the Pacific Northwest every once in a while and it's the closest thing 
uh, without spending thousands of dollars, that, you know, to experience it ourselves again, uh, that we can do, although Norway is not cheap for those that, you know, may be listening and say, wait, Norway is really expensive. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is. But yeah, I think it was the, the perfect summer holiday for us, the perfect balance. And uh, yeah, I don't think I'd change a thing. No, 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 I think, uh, and this is, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't take a moment of this for granted. We still kind of wake up every morning and pinch ourselves that we get to work the jobs that we get to do and, and to live the lives that we get to do. And the social media presence feels almost like a responsibility to kind of share the positivity, but also, well, a lot of this didn't happen without the support of those, uh, that community. We were reflecting on this today with Doug Gordon, as you, you know, from the War on Cars podcast, and it really does take a village for all the successes, uh, you know, yourself making the introduction to Heather Boyer at Island Press, Doug allowing us to sleep on in his apartment when we were on our book tour. These are all little things that we pay forward and, and, and through acts of kindness. Uh, create opportunities that uh, and this great little urbanism community that we're really uh, proud to call ourselves uh, members of. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, that made no sense whatsoever. But. No, I, I, it <laughs> made sense. To, <laughs> it made it made sense to me. I mean, I, I yeah, it was through social media that I originally uh, made contact with you. So when I learned about your uh, crowd. Uh, fundraising uh, efforts uh, to, to help with your original trip to the Netherlands. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's easy to, to dunk on social media and uh, uh, we, we do have to make sure that we are, especially for me, uh, as you well know, because uh, you can experience some of this yourself, is that as a content creator too, I kind of have to make sure that I'm not always, always on and feeling like I have to document every single step, you know, that I take to the grocery store and everything. Uh, but selfishly, I'm incredibly grateful that uh, you all have taken us along the ride on your vacations in social media and uh, and once again uh, doing so here on the Active Towns channel. Uh, Chris and Melissa, thank you so very much for doing this. It's been an absolute joy and pleasure. Yeah, no, it's our it's our absolute pleasure. And, and like you said, John, sometimes it can feel like work and it's important to turn off. But I think one of the things that brings us joy when we're traveling, when we're not turning off, is that we're showing places around the world that are doing great things. And, you know, I think that's the reason that we got into this was to show why Vancouver was doing a lot of the great things it was doing. And now to get to do that globally is, yeah, for us, uh, a privilege that we don't take for granted and we're happy to be in this space. Yeah. No city has the secret sauce. No city has a silver bullet. Everyone is dealing with its own unique challenges. And uh, But there's so much inspiration we can take and, and we channel it and share it. And, and, uh, yeah, it, it allows us to keep going and it energizes us. And, uh, There'll be plenty more trips in the future that we hope people will follow along for. Watch this space for Melissa's urbanist travel booking. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, uh, and to your point, Chris, uh, I think we all have uh, job security <laughs> in terms of yeah. there's plenty yet to do. And uh, doing what I'm doing here on the Active Towns channel, which is to try to celebrate the, the good things that are happening. And hopefully that is inspiration for other cities that if you're struggling with this, uh, please know that there are resources out there uh, that you know you can turn to. And you had mentioned uh, Jason Slaughter's uh, channel, Not Just Bikes. You mentioned Doug Gordon with the War on Cars podcast. These are all great resources that you can tap into, as well as the Dutch Cycling Embassy uh, and one wonderful firms like uh, Mobicon that is out there. So, and don't forget folks, uh, if you haven't yet already done so, uh, please be sure to check out uh, these books. They are absolutely phenomenal. I cannot recommend them enough. Uh, absolutely delightful connecting with you both once again. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Till the next time. 
Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this little uh, show and tell from Melissa and Chris Brundlett. Uh, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the Active Towns channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. Thank you all so much for tuning in. It's really wonderful to have you along for the ride. Uh, well, till next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.